Hey, what's up, YouTube? We are live. All right, guys. Uh, it's good to be back. I was uh, on vacation for a couple weeks. Went down to Florida to get some sun. Uh, spent uh, My partner, Mariah, and I, we spent a few days at Disney World. And then we drove down to the Florida Keys, spent a week there, just uh, hanging out on the beach, getting some sun, went snorkeling with stingrays, all kinds of cool stuff. So uh, it's been a few weeks, but I'm back. And uh, here we are, another uh, episode of uh, Q&A. So I'm Jonathan White. I'm here to help you master your sexual energy so you can magnetize your ideal life. And I'm going to get to the questions here in just a second. But uh, happy, you know, it's basically spring now. I love this time of year. Everything's awakening. You know, I was doing some gardening today, planting my uh, cold weather vegetables. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a good time to be alive right now. Okay, I see some questions coming in already. How's everyone doing? Hope you guys are uh, doing well. Doing well around the world. <clears throat> All right, so here's the first question. I've heard people say that when trying to have a child, it is beneficial to retain semen for a long period so the baby will be stronger. Is this true? Uh, yeah, so my take on this is there's a certain period of time. If you're trying to conceive a child, you want to have the uh, most healthy uh, sperm possible, right? So there's a certain amount of time you should retain, but you don't want to retain for too long because what happens is if you retain for really long periods of time, I've seen some studies on this, the semen actually becomes a bit degraded because, you know, the semen has a certain life cycle. It doesn't live forever. Eventually it dies and your body reabsorbs it or it urinates it out, you know? Uh, so if I was trying to conceive a child, what I would do personally is I would ejaculate once or twice first just to like clear out everything to, to have a new cycle of semen being created. And then I would be doing a lot of testicle massage. Uh, I wouldn't take any, you know, no alcohol, no marijuana, no drugs, no things like that. Uh, healthy foods, healthy thoughts, uh, you know, be in a really high vibe state. And I would retain probably for about four to six weeks. And then that would be the semen that you, you know, charge up with your intention, give it to your partner in a harmonious exchange to create a child. So that, you know, that's my own uh, thought on that. <clears throat> Any thoughts on the red pill? Uh, I'm not a red pill subscriber. You know, I, 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 I know I see the red pill stuff and a lot of it is guys who are, you know, they've been hurt in their relationships and they're kind of playing out the victim like, oh, all women are horrible and they're, you know, these whores that have to be controlled by men. And they kind of tell themselves this whole story and kind of replay out these circumstances from their past. And, you know, it's not something I'm into. I believe that, you know, what you experience in your relationships is always a dynamic of your own internal male female uh, patterns. There's a lot of your own, you know, your your mommy daddy issues always play out in your relationships. So if you're seeing these certain patterns over and over again, it's usually something that's occurring within you. This is something I experienced in my life, and you know, you can again try to control everything. You know that that kind of masculine shadow of having to control everything and uh, not uh, an inability to trust and, and really connect with someone. Right. So basically I'm not a follower of the red pill, but you know, if it's for you, that's, that's fine. Do you recommend using a fleshlight to practice sexual Kung Fu? If you're single, uh, you certainly can, you know, it is a bit more, I guess, realistic type of stimulation than just using your hand, but at the same time that can be overstimulating because it's a, you know, it's a false device. So, you know, practice with it maybe, but you know, it's, it's not necessity, but you certainly can use it. Just don't get too, you know, attached to it. Okay. Blue balls, how to get over blue balls. I recently have a partner and began practicing testicle breathing and Kegels, but almost always. I keep having blue balls due to a lot of arousal. Yeah, so there's kind of this uh, transition stage when you're learning sexual Kung Fu, when you're learning to have non-ejaculatory orgasms, which is why I, re I recommend beginning the training before you have a partner, like uh, because you start to get some of these foundations built in your body. Be when you first start working with aroused energy, it's just a lot for the body to handle in the beginning. And the more open your pathways are, the microcosmic orbit, the other channels in the body, and the more skill you have in moving your sexual energy, then the less likely you will be to experience blue balls, but really it's just a matter of training and experience. Like the first times you have non-ejaculatory sex, you know, you're probably going to experience blue balls at some point. It's not a huge deal, but the remedy to this of course is increasing your skill and cult in circulating the sexual energy before it builds up to too much arousal because there's this point where you're so aroused. There's so much pressure in your genitals that there's just not much you can do after that. You will inevitably have blue balls. And again, it's not 
it's not going to kill you. It's not a big deal, but it's uncomfortable and it can be prevented. Another major aspect of blue balls is too much tension in the pelvic floor. So notice during sex, you know, during sexual cultivation, are you, are you like really squeezing your pelvic floor a lot? Are you having those involuntary pelvic floor contractions? When you build up all this tension from that in your pelvic floor during sex, that does contribute to experiencing blue balls. So doing reverse Kegels is a remedy to this, working with your microcosmic orbit every day and really developing that upward channel of sexual energy. Uh, I experienced blue balls a lot in the beginning, but it's been a long time since I've had that issue uh, as my practice has evolved and I've gotten more successful. It's been more natural for me to move arousal out of the genitals instead of having it all built up there. <clears throat> when you have a non-ejaculatory orgasm, to get it, do you have to do Kegels or something, PC muscle effort? No, um, there is a type of non-ejaculatory orgasm that most people teach that's based on hitting the point of no return and squeezing your pelvic floor muscles to block the, basically the semen from flowing. You have this weak genital orgasm. I don't like the technique personally. It's, it's just a very weak orgasm that's limited to your genitals. The methods I use and that I'm teaching are getting into these states of full body orgasm. You can use the, the pelvic floor muscles at certain stages, but it's not a necessity. It's more about just moving this orgasmic buildup to the rest of your body, distributing it through your entire body, which doesn't require anything entirely physical, right? Though there are some physical mechanics you know, it, there's, there's a lot to it. Basically check out my playlist on YouTube, my non ejaculatory orgasms playlist to get a bit more information about that. And obviously I teach this in depth in my six week course, multi-orgasmic man as well. <clears throat> can you, okay. Can you expand on the type the style of meditation you do with your use a mantra, Alice meditation method. There's a lot of different meditation practices that I do, but basically some of the first stages are uh, sinking the mind within the body. So anchoring the mind within the body, there's a difference between, you know, sitting there and kind of getting lost in your thoughts and actually doing meditation. Right. Um, so kind of the first process is watching your breath and being able to anchor your breath down into your lower dantian. There's a difference between forcing yourself to breathe from your belly <clears throat> and actually having this quality of abdominal breathing where you anchor your, <clears throat> your awareness, your mind, your yi, and your energy down in your lower dantian. So it's a process of just sitting in the space of your lower dantian. And I teach these practices, some of the basic ones on my YouTube channel, my lower dan uh, dantian building practice, uh, you know, microcosmic orbit practice, you know, lots of different practices, but basically they involve <clears throat> stilling the mind, absorbing the mind into the body to engage the energy body, uh, opening up energy channels, circulating chi through the body and other internal alchemical practices, which kind of refine the chi that you build and turn it into a higher form. So there's a lot of different, you know, meditation practices that I do. <clears throat> I've been circulate, circulating my energy through the microcosmic orbit during stimulation for a few weeks, but I couldn't get any full body orgasm about the breath. I don't control it, but it's still calm, calmy, calming. Uh, yeah. So it takes, you know, it takes, it takes training to get to the full body orgasm states. It's, it's, it varies from person to person, but you're doing the practice, keep working with it. And again, it's really about, in my experience, removing your expectation of having this phenomenal mind-blowing orgasm because in the beginning it's going to be very very subtle you probably won't even realize you're having an orgasm because you're so focused on uh trying to have this uh peak orgasm type experience that was a mistake i made but when you really surrender and remove expectations and what i always say is redefine orgasm simply as a pleasurable pulsation of of uh, sensation in your body then it kind of it, you can really build on that and get into some really it's really about feeling what you are feeling instead of trying to get to another place and then expanding and releasing deeper into what you are feeling but keep working with it you know it takes time to really uh get it get to the higher levels of it <clears throat> How long does it take you to master sexual Kung Fu? Well, you know, it's a process of mastery. Uh, I don't believe that like you, you get to this place where all of a sudden you're a master, everything's perfect and you never have to like work hard. You know, it's a process, right? You take a few steps forward and sometimes you take a step back. It's a process of mastery. Mastery is a lifestyle because there's so many distractions. There's so many, everything's changing in the world. It, all of life is a constant changing process. You may be a master of something one day, but if your practice slips, you know, for a period of time, then you can, it's easy to slip back down. So it's a journey of mastery. It's a journey of daily practice. Right. Uh, but as far as like how long did it take me to like be proficient in these practices, I would say it took, you know, it took a few years. 
it took a few years of training to like really feel like I was at a level of, you know, somewhat mastery. Right. But again, it's a, it's, it's just an unfolding process. Okay, you talk about lower and upper Dantian, but how about the middle Dantian? Is it the same as the heart chakra? It's not the same as, you know, the Dantians are not chakras. The chakra system does interact with the Dantians, but the Dantians are these kind of primal uh, core energy sort of uh, vortexes, stored spaces in the body, right? They're different than the chakra system. The middle Dantian is the space where chi is transformed into shen. So chi is just the subtle energy uh, in your body. And it's where it's transformed into shen, which is spiritual energy. I don't talk about it a lot because working with the upper two Dantians is a lot more advanced work that takes usually years of, of underlying uh, foundational work, right? You, you know, you can, you can work with the spaces early on in your practice, but you're not gonna get to a really, really high level because you need to fill uh, from, fill from the bottom up, right? That's the Taoist kind of process. If you don't have a foundation in your lower centers before you try to work with higher centers, it's like trying to build a house from the roof down. It just doesn't work. It's going to fall back down. You can't ground the high energies that you're cultivating in those higher centers. So you start with the lower Dantian. It takes months, if not years to like fully build and really, really refine the energy in the lower Dantian before it's overflowing, uh, activating the middle Dantian, really being able to work with that. And then eventually, you know, the upper Dantian, the, uh, the crystal palace, the third eye, right? So it's, it's, it's really years of evolution in the practice and working with the middle and upper Dantian is very advanced work relatively. So that's why I don't, you know, talk about it a whole lot, but the work is there. I teach more of this stuff in my Immortal Energy Arts <clears throat> online academy. <clears throat> which you can find at immortalenergyarts.com. Okay, the tennis ball method. Yeah, so this is a, a really great, basically pelvic floor, uh, even prostate massage is you get a tennis ball. I have one here somewhere. It's over there. But anyways, uh, you take it. To, uh, let me get it really quick. All right, so the tennis ball, right? I always, I have several of these around my house. Every man should have one of these. You place it under the perineum, so the area between the genitals and the anus, and there's a soft spot a little bit closer to the anus where if you sit on that tennis ball, it's going to sink into that spot and it will give you an acupressure massage. Basically, it uh, helps to release pressure and tension in the pelvic floor. <clears throat> really great if you're doing sexual cultivation. Um, if you have a lot of pelvic floor tension, it's helpful. It also acupresses against the prostate. 50% of men have prostate issues. So anything you can do to prevent stagnance and release and balance this area of your body is going to be tremendously helpful. So that's what the tennis ball is all about. <clears throat> I get a feeling of chills or pins and needles when I'm cycling through the microcosmic orbit. Is that the same feeling you have? Uh, you know, you'll feel all kinds of different things. For me, it's like this hydraulic electrical fluid movement through my body. It's what, what she usually feels like to me. It's like this, uh, it has like an electrical quality, uh, this like hydraulic fluid. Sometimes it feels like radioactive. It's very tangible. It's very powerful. It took me years of practice for the microcosmic orbit to really be like tangible in that way. I mean, sometimes I'd have little, you know, pins and needles like you're talking about, but for like to full on feel that streaming current of energy, like unquestionably, like, yeah, this is happening. You know, this isn't like a, maybe it's my imagination. This is very obvious and apparent in my body. And if I don't focus on it, it's still running. Right. So that's kind of what it feels like to me now. That's something that takes, you know, potentially years of training because you have to really, really build chi first to have something to move through your orbit that's tangible. You're, you can still run the orbit even from the beginning. You just don't quite have the same voltage of current going through it, right? Uh, so it does become very, very tangible and powerful with time. Sometimes it like feels like it's gonna knock you over something It's so powerful. I'm concerned I might have to take the V word to keep my job. If I keep my vibration high and visualize the world where I wouldn't have to take it, is it possible I can manifest this as my reality? So you don't have to take a shot in the arm to keep your job right. Me personally, I wouldn't work at any job where I was required to do that. You know, uh, you have to understand what's important. Do you want to be a guinea pig to some weird genetic uh, altering experiment that's being injected into people's bodies around the world? Or do you want to be a sovereign being? Because once you put that in your body, there's no going back. No one can help you. No one can save you. We're going to see in the next year what is really going on with this. And uh, anyways, yes, I would do whatever you can to uh, manifest, not just by imagining and visualizing, but taking action on a different life's path for yourself. 
Do I ever listen to music when doing Qigong? Uh, I often do when I'm, you know, doing Qigong in my house, which I do in the cold months. I'll play like some very meditative, soft music. Anything that's like transient with like beats and like really sharp noises is distracting. So uh, I like to listen to solfeggio sounds. Uh, just go to YouTube, you know, solfeggio, type that in S-O-L-F-E-G-G-I-O, -E which are these certain healing frequencies of the earth. And, uh, you know, I like to listen to stuff like that when I'm doing my practice inside. But meditation I do in silence, you know, because it can be kind of a, a crutch in, or distract in some ways, right? <clears throat> When you ejaculate, then right after that, there is this moment of clarity. Suddenly thoughts flow to me faster and I also return to my senses. There's also a way to get it when you're on retention. So I'm not sure if that's a question, but you're feeling clarity right after ejaculation, which can happen because ejaculation is a release of energy. And uh, and this isn't always a bad thing. Here's the, here's the thing with ejaculation is like, it's not a necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's a very important process in the body. You know, it creates life. It's a natural physiological process, but if you overindulge in it, it's going to drain you. I'm not on this. I'm not, I don't subscribe to the belief that like you should never ejaculate and there's something wrong with ejaculating. It's just that you're clearing your energy. You're clearing your, you're releasing your life force and, and all this resources of your body. So if you have too much you know, too much energy, too much buildup, too much stagnance and an ejaculation will actually balance you and you feel this clarity, right? But if you're releasing too much, then you're just going to feel drained and depleted from it, right? And it, it, for me, it was semen retention that gave, it started to give me much more clarity and balance because I was over ejaculating in the early years of my life. Is it possible that I feel like the first day after coming, the first day after coming, I feel like transmuting more easily than the following days when I've been retaining? Well, it's because you don't have as much sexual energy the day after you ejaculate. So it's a lot easier to manage that, right? And it's when you actually start to build the sexual energy that becomes more difficult because, I mean, that's normal because, yeah, when you actually have a large charge of sexual energy, it's not so easy in the beginning to transmute it and redirect it because you have certain patterns. You're used to that sexual energy moving in, right? As in a, an impulse to masturbate and impulse to ejaculate. So uh, it's because you're working with less sexual energy. So through training, through experience, through working with your microcosmic orbit, the transmutation practices, the testicle breathing, <clears throat> you will learn how to transmute higher that higher charge of sexual energy so you can go weeks without ejaculating and you know be able to channel that energy properly <clears throat> do i ever do zhanzhuan with eyes open if i have a nice view so zhanzhuan is a it's a standing meditation qigong practice i have a, view, a video of it on my youtube channel yes i actually mostly practice this with my eyes open um it's it doesn't really matter if eyes are open or closed. They kind of say in medical Qigong, you want to keep your eyes closed because it helps keep your energy in. But um, I, I like to keep my eyes open and just kind of use, not focus on the outside world, but just keep my awareness within. Because it kind of helps train you, like how do you engage with the outside world, but still stay uh, in some ways meditative and man managing of your energy field, right? Because it's one thing to like, you know, you're out in the world, you're getting your ass kicked by stress, your business, whatever, your work. And then you, you come home and you're like a Zen master when you're in your meditation because it's like a whole different world. But then you go back into the world and it's, you know, you're just getting your ass kicked around. So it's like, how do you integrate these two things? How do you be a Zen master when you're in the world? How do you maintain your practice when you're out in the world doing the worldly things, right? So anything that helps you do that, which is why I, I really uh, resonate with the Taoist practices because it's like, how do you manage your energy, but still be a human being, you know, not some monk, you know, escaping society in the cave in the mountains, right? <clears throat> when starting semen retention, what are the most important daily practices to handle that high energy? Basically, you want to focus on three things, clearing, circulating, and grounding. So clearing uh, methods that allow you to clear negative emotions, uh, stuck energy, excessive energy. You know, you can have too much energy, right? You don't want to have tons of energy necessarily. You want to have balanced energy. So clearing practices, there's, there's many different, you know, techniques. I, I teach a lot of clearing practices in the first week of my course. So anything that helps you clear stagnant energy, clear out what you don't need from your body. So that's the first category, right? Circulation. 
you need to keep your sexual energy flowing. This is the number one mistake that men do. They just go into semen retention without any sort of skill in managing their energy. And you're starting to play with this atomic firepower that sexual energy is without knowing what you're doing. It becomes stagnant. It gets stuck. You turn into a stressed out, you know, blue balled, uh, angry person, right? So you need to circulate that energy. So Qigong practice, uh, the microcosmic orbit, testicle breathing, these circulate your energy. You want to be doing this very regularly if you're doing semen retention. In fact, I don't recommend doing semen retention if you're not doing these things. And then the third one is grounding. Grounding is super, super important because when you're disconnected, when you're ungrounded, when you're disconnected from the earth, you're up in your head, you're floating up here in the ethers and the mental planes, you can't hold as much of an energetic charge. So you're going to feel uh, when you, when you start to build the sexual charge, it, you need to disperse it almost immediately because you don't have a container to feel that energy. It's like having a high voltage, you know, current with that's not grounded. It's dangerous, right? So when you learn to ground that sexual energy, I teach how to directly connect, wire your sexual energy into the energy of the earth in my six week course so that you connect the earth's chi with your sexual energy. It cools it down. You mix that cooling earth energy with it makes it much more manageable because as men, our sexual energy is very fire. It's very volatile. It's very, you know, difficult to control. So when you ground that energy, it becomes a lot easier to work with, easier to digest. And when you're grounded into the earth, you have this massive yin storage container that the earth is and you can hold so much more energy. So those are the most important things to focus on when doing semen retention is clearing, circulating, and grounding. And if you don't do these things, you're probably going to have issues. What books do you recommend to start diving into semen retention and last longer in bed? There's, there's a few books uh, that I recommend. One is Taoist Secrets of Love, Cultivating Male Sexual Energy from Montauk Chia and Michael Wynn's fantastic book. I will say that the practices are a bit outdated. There's a lot of very tension-based practices, which uh, may or may not help your premature, if you have premature ejaculation, may or may not help. But overall, the book is really solid. Also, Tao of, Sex, uh, Tao of Sexology by Stephen Chang. I think it's out of print now, but you can find a PDF version online. Those are really great books um, to start with. <clears throat> What's the longest you ever lasted for? Are you are you talking about during sex? <laughs> uh, personally, the longest sex session I had was about six hours, with you know a couple breathers here and there in it. I said, okay, you said you met your current girl on a dating app. Was there any for any specific reason? Like the girls you met on the street weren't good. Uh, you know, it was just it was spontaneity. It's just how things unfolded for me. I was kind of putting it out there. I mean, I wasn't even really trying hard to meet someone. It was just like, you know, oh, you know, I, I, I kind of want to like meet some girls, you know, maybe date a little bit. And of course I was meeting girls in person, uh, but I was pretty choosy about who I was going to spend my time with. So, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to try these dating apps, whatever. Tinder didn't have much <laughs> success with, but it was Bumble. I was using Bumble and, you know, the only girl I ever uh, met up with from a dating app was Mariah, who's been my partner. We've been, you know, we, we resonated immediately and uh, I fell in love with her. It was kind of a friendship that evolved into a relationship. We've been together for four years. So it's just, it's just how it happened. You know, uh, it's going to be different for everyone, but <clears throat> when you, when you know what you want, well, when you know what you want, but you're not needy, you're not attached to it, and you're uh, in a good vibration within yourself, then you will attract the situation to, you know, uh, meet like-minded people. Okay, in the dragon orbit Qigong form, do we inhale into sun and moon at some point? Could you give possible insights? For example, the fact that the sun is on the left and the moon is on the right. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but so this is, a, is the Qigong form I teach in my six week course as the dragon orbit form. One of the movements you're working with the sun and moon energies. Basically, the most important thing in the form is not focusing on the sun and moon themselves. It's just kind of a, a an augmentation, like, you know, you're because the sun and moon represent these natural polarities, these higher polarities, you know. Um, it's like in Taoism, they don't work with deities, they work with natural forces, you know, the sun and moon, because they're very, very high frequency. And it's it's kind of a direct connection with the life force. So instead of like connecting with the deity, who's kind of an in-between person, you're going direct with the life force. And the sun and moon are a very direct representation, a direct uh, embodiment of high frequency life force, right? And they're two 
um, they're polarities. Sun, yang, moon, yin. Moon is magnetic. It's reflective. The sun radiates. It just it shines 24-7. So you're connecting with these kind of almost archetypal yin-yang patterns. It balances your own energy, your own yin-yang, because what the cause of all disease and imbalance is male-female imbalance within yourself. Yin and yang, you know. And so that's kind of where you're connecting with that form. But the most important thing, the form is not focusing on the sun and the moon, but keeping your mind anchored within your body, relaxing, sinking the shoulders, all the Zhanjuan type engagements. Keep your mind on the dolling point, the inner wrist. That's like a, it's like the, uh, so you can imagine the Lao Gong point in your palm, which is most people say to focus on that, most Qigong teachers. But if you imagine a fire hose, the Lao Gong point, yeah, that's where the water's shooting out. But what about the nozzle that controls it? That's what the dolling point is. You hope focus your mind here when you're doing Qigong the dulling point, and it it really, really accelerates the chi, which it starts, at the, the, the chi moves up the legs, through the torso, over the head, and into the arms, and into the hands. That's the last connection point. So if you feel the chi in your hands, you know it's moved through your whole body. So keep your mind on the dulling. I know there's a lot of talk about, uh, about it, but yeah, hopefully that helps. <laughs> did you delete your recent sun gazing YouTube video? No, I did not. I believe it should, should still be up there. Uh, Maybe it's not. I haven't checked, but it should still be up there. Or maybe it's not. If you're asking about it, I don't know. <laughs> what is your take? Why is there so much sexual interest towards childs? One of the biggest black market in the world. Oh, man. So the pedophilia, the human trafficking, the child trafficking, it's sick. It's disturbing. It's um, It's kind of the elephant in the room on this planet it, that it's happening on such a widespread scale pedophilia child trafficking sex trafficking horrific horrific stuff that's worldwide happening on the planet and a lot of very powerful people on this planet most of the you know elite leaders of this planet are in on this child pedophilia stuff it's disgusting you know this kind of came out during the whole epstein thing right um why is this such a major thing well it's a it's a it's a dark side thing right a child has this you know, powerful life force and this innocence and these nasty dark forces feed off of that. That's about all I'm going to say about it. It's disgusting. It's horrific, but it's at least coming into the light, people becoming aware of this, and hopefully it's going to end sooner than later. I sometimes think I feel the chi better after smoking weed and then doing qigong and yoga meditation. Is this a possibility? Yeah, well, you know, when you take these these things, uh, you know, you're taking substances, sometimes it does increase your sensitivity. It really opens you up. It shifts you into a, a much more kind of, you know, a different frame of mind than your worldly consciousness, right? And so, yeah, it, it can cause increased sensitivity and enhanced uh, uh just experiences in some way, but the issue is that you rely on the substance that can actually be depleting your energy, right? And so I don't recommend you rely on it. Any You can cultivate the stuff. In fact, I recommend doing your practice sober, right? Because uh, otherwise you're just relying on a crutch, right? Otherwise like, well, I, I only have a good Qigong session when I'm stoned. So it sets you up for failure basically, right? So you'll eventually develop your sensitivity in a sober frame of mind. You just have to do the practice. So that, you know, it's my recommendation. I'm not saying you can't, you know, have some fun, you know, every now and then we're all human, but don't make that, you know, don't set yourself up with a crutch where you have, feel like you need this thing before you can cultivate your energy because it will cause you more issues in the long run if that's your pattern. Uh, my vacation in Key West was awesome. It was my first time, my first time in Florida, actually. I had never been there before. Six week course will be opening up against next month. Uh, make sure you know you follow me on my social media. If you're on my email list by signing up for my free ejaculation control course, then you will you will know when the, the course opens up again. <clears throat> When you have sex without ejaculating, are you always equally effective in transmuting? Do you need time before to prepare? Does it depend on the right person you are with? Does it work with any uh, one night stand? Uh, you know, it's going to be different every day, especially in the beginning. Like, you know, maybe when I was first trying, first 
having non-ejaculatory sex, first learning sexual Kung Fu, it's like the first time it was like, oh yeah, I'm doing this properly. Everything's flowing. I feel the, the sexual energy moving through my body. And then maybe another time was like, oh, I, I feel like I'm going to ejaculate immediately. Right. So it's a bit of a process. Um, but obviously the more I practice, the much more effortless kind of natural it is for me just to engage in lovemaking where it's about energy flowing through the whole body instead of, oh, I need to ejaculate. Right. And there's so many factors to ejaculation control your energy. It changes day to day. So that's why you have to be, you, you have to constantly be in your practice to keep your channels open, keep yourself in the zone, to keep your mind calm, keep yourself in the parasympathetic, you know, nervous system state. Um, as far as needing time before to prepare, just again, it depends if, you know, because I practice Qigong meditation, you know, I'm doing this stuff for hours a day. So I'm pretty much in the zone every day, you know, most of the day. Right. Uh, but if I was, you know, maybe stressed out or something, feeling a bit out of it, then yes, I might do a little, uh, some sort of practice or just calming practice or my partner and I would do like a massage on each other or something like that to kind of get into the, the, the space to, to clear out. Uh, your partner does have a major impact on it. If you're with someone who you don't feel, you know, you can really open up to, then you're going to have some difficulty with these practices. One night stands, it, it can work if you feel a good connection, but if you, if, if, if it's kind of a disharmonious connection, you know, then it might not work. It's difficult to say, right. There's a lot of factors to it basically, which is why, you just need to practice and, you know, uh, stay in your practice, basically, right? It's an evolution. And definitely don't recommend doing this when you're drunk. I, I mean, I stopped drinking by the time I got into sexual kung fu practices, so I can't really say much about that. But alcohol does really lower your vibration. It really numbs your mind and your connection with your energy. It can open you up to some nasty stuff. So I do, you know, I don't recommend drinking in general, but if you must, that's fine. But I don't recommend doing these kinds of practices in an uh, intoxicated state. <clears throat> Is it compatible with rough sex or is it just a different mood? No, you can totally uh, have some, you know, very uh, intense animalistic friction sex if you want with sexual kung fu because you develop your ejaculation control, you know, and, you know, with my partner and me, we're, we, we kind of alternate between, you know, more intense uh, stimulating rough sex and more calm, meditative, slow movements, right? It's not like uh, that, that's, that's kind of the misconception some people's have some people has like oh you just have to like pretty much stay still and like do these you know meditative practices and chant mantras no it, it you know there can be some of that but you can have very intense uh friction sex right but you want to be able to have other sexual experiences right because only having that intense friction sex that it numbs you after a period of time just it numbs your nerves it just doesn't feel that good after a while right so having that kind of variety of stimulation is very important as well <clears throat> after building sexual tension through sexual pleasure through self-pleasure i stop and take a deep breath and i bend backwards but it feels like i'm a pass out <laughs> why is that uh because all the sexual energy is flooding through your body and sometimes when you take deep breaths and then hold your breath and like do a back bend or something you get this like rush of oxygen I feel like you're going to pass out. So it just happens from that. Okay. Did a semen retention period for 60 days and completely lost my sex drive, had to break the streak. Then my sex drive went crazy thoughts. So this is pretty normal. And this is why I don't advocate necessarily going really, really long periods of time in retention. Uh, I have my, you know, after much experimentation, you know, I've been doing semen retention for seven years, not saying I retain for seven years, but overall I've been doing this practice for seven years. So I've experienced every different dynamic of it and I've experimented in the beginning. I was, you know, as most guys doing semen retention is the obsessive. I can never ejaculate again, no matter what. I'm going to go as long as I can. And I found eventually I realized that, you know, going beyond even like I, for me, it's about four to six weeks. If I go beyond that, then I actually start to lose benefits because what happens is your body's like, oh, he's not having sex. Well, not not having sex, but like your your endocrine system kind of starts to atrophy. So after four to six weeks, it can be good to have an ejaculation because it kind of restarts your endocrine system. Your sperm production increases, your testosterone actually increases at that point because it usually drops after four to six weeks. So this is what you experience. It's been my experience as well. That's why I recommend cyclic retention where you have some occasional ejaculations to kind of clear out the prostate and kick the endocrine system back into uh, service, right? <clears throat> Okay. 
What are my thoughts of a modern man in a relationship who does not practice semen retention? What's your perspective on the masculine and feminine relationship in that regards compared to a man on semen retention? Well, I mean, it's kind of a vague question because, you know, there can be so many different dynamics in, you know, all of these relationships, whether or not you're practicing semen retention. But just in general, uh, typically <clears throat> a man who's ejaculating every day, you know, having sex every day and ejaculating every day over time he's, he wears himself out. He depletes himself because ejaculating every day is it's just too much. And it's, it's at least better with your, when you're with a partner having sex, because you, you, there's kind of an exchange, but overall you're just kind of uprooting, you're, you're, you're uprooting your kidney system, right? Uh, in Chinese medicine, your kidneys are responsible for your sexual energy, sperm production. So, uh, it can lead to kind of this depletion in the relationship and kind of a loss of the polarity in the relationship. I'm not saying it's going to happen to everybody. Obviously there's lots of couples that the man's ejaculating every day and they are in love. They're well connected for a long period of time. So there's lots of factors to it, but this is something that can happen is uh, a man's sexual virility starts to decrease because he's ejaculating every day, especially when he gets to do his thirties and forties. Um, <clears throat> and so this can lead to kind of a, you know, some issues in the relationship where the man doesn't quite have the sex drive he used to, he doesn't have the uh, testosterone levels, things like this, right? Um, whereas when a man's having, it is in a sexual relationship where he's practicing retention, there's usually a lot more desire that's sustained for a longer period of time. Because again, when a man ejaculates, it's just, he's just throwing everything out there. And often you just feels empty afterwards, especially when you're doing that every day, right? You just kind of feel this emptiness. There's not much of a sexual charge. It takes a few days for it to build up. And if you're not recovering for a few days, then you're just in a depleted state. So the dynamic of the man who's retaining his semen, or at least, you know, uh, at least not ejaculating every time, then there's still desire at the end of the sexual, you know, the, the lovemaking session. You should always, you know, you, always, you still have a bit of sexual desire at the end of that versus just feeling like, wiped out and tired. Well, no more sexual desire. I couldn't keep having sex. So uh, I don't, it's kind of a, a lot of words I've just said about this, but, but, you know, there's a lot of dynamics to it. There's a lot of factors, but overall personally for me, uh, it's, it's for me, the, the semen retention lifestyle is the way to go. Any tips with dealing with emotional trauma from past girlfriends? Um, inner work, you know, meditation, qigong, energy work, clearing out these patterns. Because when we experience a trauma, when we experience a difficult situation, it creates this imprint in our energetic body. It often creates a blockage, you know, this space where energy is not able to flow, usually around the heart area. A lot of men are very blocked off in their, their chest, their heart area, very numb in here, right? <clears throat> So anything that gets this energy flowing for me, Qigong, you know, meditation practices, yoga, help me really open up and clear these pla these past blockages. And I teach a lot of these tools in my six week course, you know, transformational breath work and things like that. Um, so that's, you know, what's been most helpful for me. You know, you can also have some outside help, go to a healer type person, someone who does like Reiki energy work, you know, acupuncture, whatever these things can be very valuable as well. But basically you need to get that energy flowing instead of holding on to these uh, negative emotions, these stories from the past, these traumas, you're able to clear them and release them so that your energy can flow freely. So you feel good again. Awakening the microcosmic orbit by acupuncture. Is it possible? Yeah. It, you know, acupuncture can affect the dew and ran meridians, but the thing is, is that you don't, you don't want to make this your primary approach. You want to be able to have the ability to do this because if you're only doing it through acupuncture, you don't really have that connection your personal connection to your microcosmic orbit. Someone else is working with it. So doing the meditation, you know, deepening that mind body connection, that ability to affect your microcosmic orbit with your yi, your intention, you know, your, your shin, your heart mind, uh, that's a required skill for sexual Kung Fu ability, right? And no one else can do that for you, but acupuncture can help you kind of, you know, develop more awareness of this, uh, area of your body and open it up. <clears throat> Can sexual energy help heal heart and lungs? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you can you can bring sexual energy to anywhere in the body, you know, bring it to the organs, whatever. So it definitely can.
You know, you, you get to a point or you, even just working with unaroused sexual energy, directing that around your body. But, you know, kind of the procedure is during sex or solo cultivation, you build up the arousal, build up the charge. Um, and then you when you're at a point of high arousal, you bring that energy into whatever part of the body you're trying to heal and let it absorb there. <clears throat> Is sexual Kung Fu a difficult process to go through? Is there a lot of difficult healing needed needed to be done? And can it be easily attained? There's a lot of factors. Um, for most men, no, it's not an easy path. It's not a, you know, it's not an overnight change. This is, and the name sexual Kung Fu implies this. Kung Fu is a skill, it's a discipline attained through a period of training, regular training. Um, so no, it's not easy. It's not instant gratification as, you know, our society promotes, but it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, it's going to be different for every person, you know, depending on your background, how stuck in your current patterns you are. But as soon as you begin the practice, you're going to notice a huge difference just within the first few days, even maybe in the first time you do, you know, on the practices and, you know, but just the stories I've heard from men going through my course, the amazing transformations that occur. People, they're like, I can't believe how powerful this work is, not just on your sexual life, but every aspect of your life, because you learn to liberate yourself. You learn to release past emotions, clear blockages that are keeping you from being where you want to be in your life and being open, you know, and in enjoyment of life, learning how to hold more energy, ground that energy to become, you know, very embodied, very uh, uh, causal, right? You have more ability to affect your reality. So um, again, it's going to depend on your background, what you've been through, but overall it takes some work. It takes daily practice, but it's incredibly rewarding. <clears throat> okay is there a difference between tantra and sexual kung fu if so what are the main differences so yeah there's definitely some differences and you know tantra is a word that gets thrown around a lot tantra was basically a path it was a yoga system right uh where and and of tantra sexual practices were a very small percentage of it kind of like taoism right taoism involved some sexual practices but it wasn't the main emphasis same thing with tantra it just but in the West, uh, you know, the word Tantra has become associated with sex and kind of these sexual therapies. A lot of modern Tantra is just kind of Western sexual therapy systems with some ancient Eastern terms kind of superimposed on them, you know. Um, so the, the Tantra stuff is very, very mixed in its quality and in its depth, right? But basically, true Tantric systems and sexual Kung Fu system, the main differences are that in Tantra, you're really, there's a lot of work with like deities, kind of, you know, you're embodying Shiva, embodying Shakti, it's very ritualistic, and it can be kind of overly occultish or, or you know, mystical for some people. And whereas I find the Taoist practices and sexual Kung Fu, it's very practical, you're not connecting with deities, you're just getting a deeper connection with your own body, you're working directly with your energy meridians, the pathways, uh, and, you know, circling the energy or cycling the energy with your mind off. And also in Tantra, there's often this emphasis on one directional flow of energy. A lot of the Indian systems is just about uh, act, you know, that Kundalini activation, just bring the energy up, up to the crown, shooting it up into the heavens, right? That's typically the only flow of energy. Whereas the, the Taoist systems, they stress uh, the upward flow, but also the downward flow. In fact, the downward current is almost more important because that's the grounding, the yin, the feminine current, right? So the microcosmic orbit, yin, yang, balance, uh, the eight extraordinary meridians, the, the, the eight psychic channels, you know, the belt channel, this horizontal flow, the arm and leg channels. So it's a, it's a much more embodied system in my approach. And, you know, both have great benefits. They're, they're both amazing, you know, whatever resonates with you, that's fine. But that's kind of, you know, been my experience in, and, uh, the differences between them. <clears throat> I don't know what to think about when masturbating, fantasizing about ex-girlfriends feels like living in the past and fantasizing about women I know seems like I'm creating creepy or bad vibes. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of different things. I, 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 again, I don't recommend going crazy with like fantasy sometimes in like the very beginning just to gain arousal. It might help you a bit, but just focus on your body, focus on the sensations you're feeling, learn to generate arousal just by feeling the pleasure in your body. You can even use a mirror, look at yourself appreciate your own beauty, appreciate the love you have for yourself or cultivate a relationship with yourself, right? And find the, the, the centrality in that. Maybe that's weird for some people, but it's like, you should, why should you not feel, you know, loving of yourself? Why should you not feel sexual and sexual, uh, 
aroused by your own body, right? There's, there's nothing wrong with it. It could be a very powerful relationship to build. So it's something you can try. But again, just focus on the pleasure that you're feeling and let that be your what builds arousal in you. And this is something that takes, you know, a transition. If you're used to um, looking at porn every day, you know, it, it just it overstimulates your brain so much that there's kind of a recover a recovery period to build normal uh, arousal sensitivity. <clears throat> Ever used a prostate massager? I recommend trying it. It helps relax the prostate. Yes, uh, I made a video about uh, experiencing prostate orgasms in my experience with that. So yeah, prostate massage is a great, a great tool for men to awaken deeper aspects of pleasure, deeper orgasms, and also learning to relax and clear these pelvic floor tension patterns. And obviously this is an area that a lot of men uh, feel shy, afraid about, like, oh, it's going to make me gay, which doesn't really make any sense, but you know, I understand. So yeah, it's, it's powerful. What makes me question the, the V word? There's a lot of censorship going on. Where do you get your information? How do you trust one source and not another? Well, look at this, the mainstream. Like, if this thing is so safe, why is uh, why are the people promoting it still wearing masks? They say they've already gotten it. There's nothing to worry about. Um, why are they so desperate to roll this thing out? Why do they have to convince you it's so safe if it is? If you look into what it really is, the patents they have on it, which they're profiting from immensely. The CDC gets, I think, 70 to 80% or more of their profits from that, from the V words. Okay. That's what their business is. This is marketing. If you, if you're into marketing, you understand when someone's doing marketing, they're trying to sell you something. They're not trying to help you. They're trying to make a profit. Um, watch the documentary Vaxxed, V-A-X-X-E-D. Here, some, you know, experts give their own opinion on it, then, you know, come to a conclusion. Um, and again, what they're putting in this thing, they're injecting into people. It's completely experimental. It affects your genes, your DNA. It's a little sketchy, right? Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of an Orwellian wet dream what's happening in the world right now. So, you know, do your research beyond the surface whenever fear is being used to whenever it's like, oh, here's this horrible thing. You have to be afraid of it. Oh, but here's the solution. And that solution usually requires uh, some sort of infringement on your, your own personal freedom, right? Then you know that there's a dark force behind that. It's been happening over and over again for thousands of years now. And, you know, I, I guess that's about all I can say about it right now, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not putting it in my body, no matter what, you know, tr we, we, we have powerful, you know, immune systems. We've human, human bodies have been on this planet for thousands of years. And uh, if you're going to hand over your own health, your own freedom to someone else who's out to make money, you know, then I don't know. Other than not ejaculating, any other tips on being more sexual or aroused when I'm with my partner? Um, well, I mean if you're not feeling sexual or aroused with your partner, then yeah, that can be something to look into. Do you have a good connection with your partner? Are your hormones in balance? You know, is your testosterone low? Things like that. You know, do you exercise? Do you spend time in nature? Are you stressed out? How's your diet? You know, are you getting your minerals? Are you getting your zinc, your, uh, your magnesium, your selenium, your boron, are you getting enough sleep. Are you doing Qigong? You're doing sexual Kung Fu practices to build your sexual energy. These are some things to look into. <clears throat> Would you recommend going off porn completely in order to practice the ejaculation control exercises? I understand that it's important to practice them when un when aroused. I do recommend completely going off porn. See, I experimented with this myself. It was like I was learning to have non-ejaculatory sex and, you know, I was like, okay, well, I'm no longer attached to ejaculating. So maybe I can look at porn because I'm just going to have a non-ejaculatory session. So not a big deal, right? It overstimulates you like crazy. It's not a substitute for the real life thing. It's just it it causes so many imbalances in your energy body. For me, it's like it built this heat, it, this over stimulated heat in my genitals. I couldn't control my sexual energy like I can in, you know, in a normal real life situation. And it gives me headaches. Uh, basically it's overstimulating. And I found like, if I looked at porn, even like two to three days later, I had this unresolved overstimulated sexual energy and I would it would like make me ejaculate quickly. So I don't recommend porn at all personally. If it works for you, that's fine, but that's just my you know, experience with it. Learn to cultivate arousal without it because 
The thing is when you rely on porn, it's difficult to become aroused without it because it's so overstimulating. So it really throws off your, your whole body and mind basically. In the Multigasmic Man course, do you explain the process of setting the energy up in detail? Yes, it's very in-depth, very comprehensive. I teach you how to, first of all, open the energy centers in your body, you know, gain this connection, this mind-body connection to your energy, to ground that energy. There's a lot of preparation work before you work with sexual energy because if you don't do that, if you have no experience of working with energy and then you try to work with your sexual energy, it's like trying to control, you know, wild horses. It's just too much. So there's these foundations and then you start playing with the sexual energy itself and I teach you the process, yes, how to move it through your body, how to bring it into the organs, how to move it into the brain, how to exchange it with your partner, what to do when you're too aroused. Yes, I go way into depth on this. Okay. Um, I'm sure you must have failed in the beginnings of trying full body orgasm. What was the technique that helped you achieve it? Yeah. You know, I definitely had my, you know, uh, accidentally going over the edge. It happens in your practice. It's going to happen. Don't worry about it. You know, you're investing in your future of becoming a, a, a master of your sexual energy. Uh, for me, it wasn't necessarily a specific technique. I mean, there's lots of techniques, you know, I use techniques. I teach tons of techniques in my courses. There's lots of techniques, but what really did it for me being able to achieve the the full body orgasm, it's really a letting go. The techniques kind of like the techniques are to help program your energy in some ways, you know, to flow in a different way. And they may or may not be directly what gives you, you know, brings you to the orgasm, but really these, these full body orgasms, these non-ejaculatory orgasms, you can't force yourself into them. You can set the stage for them. You can draw the energy up, but you, it's not something you can control so to speak, right? That's kind of the masculine thing is like, we want to control everything. You can control peak orgasms, but not the full body orgasm. It's something you have to surrender to, you have to let go to, open up to this connection with your partner, open up to a connection with yourself. Instead of trying to get somewhere, you just let go and feel what is, and it starts to build and build. So, you know, I, I, I explain this in my course, you know, in depth, um, but it's not so much about a certain technique as it is uh, developing a different connection with your sexuality, with your mind and your body, what you're focusing on, letting go and creating space in your body to allow that orgasm to occur, basically. <clears throat> Any tips on satisfying a woman sexually? Well, she's got to be able to trust you. She's got to be able to, she must be able to surrender into her feminine. So you must be a strong, trustworthy, you know, holding that masculine space, supporting the feminine so that she can let go and surrender into her body. A woman who cannot let go, a woman who cannot trust uh, and open up to her partner is a woman who will not be able to orgasm. And so, you know, that's number one is trust, intimacy, you know, uh, that connection, emotional connection is very important as well. Men, it's always, men are always like, Oh, it's this technique. You got to touch the G spot. And this is just this way. And sure. There's, there's a place for that, but for the, for the feminine, it's more about, uh, being able to just be in this open, it feeling safe in her body, feeling safe, uh, in your presence. And so it's up to you as a man to create a safe space for her. And then as far as that, you know, and as far as the more technical things, you know, uh, Give her a massage first. Touch her whole body. Give her a foot massage. It's very grounding. Uh, a lot of people in the modern world, we're stuck up in our heads and it's difficult to get back into the body from that. So for a woman, you know, massage her, her head, her temples and start massaging down her body from there. You know, the shoulders, release the shoulders, the back, uh, the breast massage is great for women. Make your way down to the feet. So you're kind of drawing the energy down, you know, uh, the kidney meridian in the legs, the kidney one point in the feet, uh, foot massage is great. And then you can start making your way towards the yoni, right? Um, massaging around the vulva area, uh, a little bit of clitoris, but don't get too much into that. Uh, working with the G spot and the A spot is can be incredibly powerful for women and bring them to much different internal orgasms. So, you know, <laughs> there's that. Hope that helps. Any thoughts or perspectives on circumcision? Uh, I think circumcision is a very bizarre practice. Like, 
you know, genital mutilation of babies, like where did that start? Like as soon as a baby's born, though, gotta cut this part of its penis off. You know, it's a little, it's a little weird. Um, you know, so that's, I guess that's about my only thoughts on it. Like, I don't, I'm not one of these, you know, I was circumcised personally. I'm not one of these people who's like, oh, my life was ruined because I'm circumcised. Like, okay, I'm circumcised, big deal. Um, I still enjoy sex. Um, I don't know what it's like to not be circumcised. So I, you know, can only say so much. Um, I think it's a weird practice to be circumcising children. You know, I wouldn't do it personally, but you know, it's, it's whatever. It's not the worst problem we're having on the planet right now, but it's, I think it's a, a strange thing. Okay. Did you go without dating and sex for a while before meeting your current partner? Is it better to be single and heal slash cultivate than to rush into sex relationship? Um, yeah, I, I'm really big on, uh, cultivating yourself and because if you just go from like partner to partner to partner, as most people do, then you're likely bringing that same baggage from the previous relationship into the next relationship. People wonder, well, why am I having the same partner? Why is the same thing happening over and over again? Why do women keep leaving me for other men or things like that? Because you're in a certain dynamic in your relationship, probably linked to the relationship you have with your mother and father, and you're playing that over and over in your relationship. So, and so what can help you resolve this? What helped me resolve this was I spent a long time being single just focusing on my practice. I'm like, you know what? It's really distracting dealing with opposite sex right now. All this, all the drama I keep getting myself into. I'm like, wow, it's actually a lot more. Uh, uh, there's actually a lot less stress in my life when I'm single. So I went through this long period of being single was when I started learning sexual Kung Fu, really practicing in depth, really gaining skill in my sexual energy and really working on some of these underlying issues I was having that kept playing themselves out. And, you know, the current relationship I'm in has been absolutely phenomenal. I'm not saying there's hasn't been, you know, I haven't had our things come up, but we've been able to deal with them in a much more holistic way and a more harmonious way. So I do recommend uh, cultivating yourself when you're in between relationships, let go of the baggage, the trauma, whatever before, and don't bring that into your next relationship. Is there a way to increase your sex drive using breathing or other techniques? In the case of someone in good shape already, yeah, I mean, breathing is a, is a great practice. Um, you have you have to be careful though. A lot of the Wim Hof stuff, kind of the pranayama stuff, it's very very popular right now for good reason. It's great. It's phenomenal practice, but too much of the very forceful breathing, you know, it can burn out your kidneys because it's force. It's fire, and the fire burns out the water. The water needs to cool the fire, but when the fire is always burning, you use up your water, right? So the breathing that really nourishes your sexual energy is slow, gentle, abdominal breathing, clearing the mind. And uh, that helps to rebuild the sexual energy because in Chinese medicine, the, the lungs, the breathing, you know, that's the metal element. And in the, the creation cycle where the five elements nourish each other, the metal sinks and becomes the water. So the, the, the lungs breathe in the air, the metal element sinks into the kidneys and it nourishes the kidneys. So the, the metal nourishes the water. So certain breathing practices that are gentle and slow, not forceful, will help you to build that sexual energy. Also breathing into your genitals, you know, the, the Tesco breathing type practice, kidney breathing where you're breathing into your kidneys, even reverse breathing, not like the really, most people teaching reverse breathing. It's like suck in your stomach, you know, suck your, you know, squeeze your perineum as hard as you can. It's too forceful. A gentle pulling in from the chi high point, you know, about an inch beneath the belly button, pulling that towards the, uh, the Ming Men, the lower back that helps kind of compress and nourish the kidneys. Finally mastered sex without ejaculation. Awesome. Well done, brother. What is your thoughts on ejaculating on trees? Um, I haven't done it personally, but you know, it's, it's better than throwing it down the toilet or into a tissue, you know, giving it back to the earth, I guess, kind of recycling it. So that's great. Oh, okay. Instagram. I'm about to lose the feed here. I'm going to close it and restart. You have an hour limit on Instagram. So I'm going to pull my live back up here on Instagram.
All right. Okay. What's your take on psychedelics? Ever done any? <laughs> yeah, uh, I was way into psychedelics in my early 20s. You know, when I was 19, I had my first psilocybin mushroom experience and I had this kundalini awakening. My energy rushed up my spine, up my head, and I uh, I became one with the universe. It was kind of an activation. It was a spiritual awakening for me. Completely changed my life, completely changed the course of my life. And then I spent the next year or so trying to recreate that experience. So I took more psilocybin mushrooms, took other psychedelics. I was like, I need to get back to that place, but I never could. It was never the same. In fact, I had some very terrifying, hellish experiences. And uh, kind of where I'm at with it now, I don't take them anymore. I don't really do drugs, substances these days. But um, the thing with psychedelics is they can be very, very powerful allies. They can be powerful teachers. They can accelerate your growth in a short period of time. But the problem is that a lot of people become dependent on them and they take them over and over and over and feel they, they start to give their power to these external things saying like, well, I can only feel spiritual if I'm taking this drug. So that limits you. And the, you know, the so-called enlightenment that you're experiencing isn't really coming from you. It's coming from this external thing. So that's what really got me into the internal arts, meditation, Qigong, yoga um, is because you are creating this uh, this awakening, this opening from within yourself, using your, your own energy, no external thing. Because the problem with drugs is that they wear off, you drop back down. You know, I know lots of people who, you know, their lives are a mess, but they, they go and take ayahuasca to kind of escape from their life and they don't have this awakening, but then they come back into their life, not having really solved their underlying issues. So it's like, you know, what good is it really doing you? Right. And, I'm not, and again, I'm not saying these things are bad, but you just, you have to be, you have to approach it from a space of awareness. Are you just relying on it? Are you just trying to get high? You know, are you actually integrating your experience? Are you respecting the plant medicines? Are you taking time away from them to integrate and things like that? So, and another thing is that they, they deplete a bit of your gene, right? When you take a psychedelic substance, a drug, it burns up some of your physical essence, your gene to fuel that high state. And it can be worth it to have, you know, profound clarity, insights, and healings. But if you're doing this regularly, and especially if you're serious about energetic cultivation, it can kind of, you know, actually be taking steps backwards for you. So basically how I feel about it is it's fine if you want to do it, but everything, you know, in balance. Don't do it every day. And I don't think doing it multiple times a week, you know, for most substances is a good idea. So, uh, only do it with respect, with intention and don't do it regularly. It is how I feel about it. If you're going to do it. <clears throat> okay. Would doing the six healing sounds practice boost your recovery after an ejaculation, even though it's a clearing practice, uh, not it's it's not really going to boost your sexual energy there's other practices for that which you know focusing on building your kidney energy your sexual energy so you know qigong practices grounding uh abdominal breathing testicle breathing these are more uh testicle massage these are going to build your sexual energy six healing sounds is simply a clearing practice it's not really going to build your sexual energy <clears throat> okay and how do i know when i should stop doing it or maybe doing it every day for 20 minutes it, it just, it depends, you know, do you feel complete with it? Do you feel like you've had a good release? You know, um, I often, as kind of a maintenance practice, I go through two or three rounds of, or, or sorry, I do each of the sounds two to three times, you know, it takes like five minutes and uh, that's kind of what I do daily. But if I'm like really having some sort of stress or negative emotion come up, then yeah, I'll do a, 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 a deeper practice, but really you can do it for as long as you want, you know, when, until you feel complete with the practice. Should you wait after eating before doing Zhanzhuan, moving Qigong, yoga, and meditation? Yeah, you don't want to eat a big meal and then, you know, do your practice. So if it's like a light snack, you know, you're probably fine. But if you have like a meal, I would say wait a minimum of 30 minutes before doing your practice. Do you think that it's possible with sexual Kung Fu to bring back the sexual vitality for men at any age that they had as a teenager? Definitely. I mean, you know, it, there's a lot of factors as well, but overall, yes, sexual Kung Fu does help men who are getting up there in the age, regain a lot of the vitality, uh, the virility of their younger years. In fact, I had a student who was, I think he was, he was almost 70. And he said that doing the sexual Kung Fu practice made him feel like a teenager again his sex drive increased like, you know, he said it was way up. So yes, these things will really, really help your sexual vitality as you get older. During an erection, the glands seem soft only after stimulation, it gets hard. Is that normal? Yes. It's quite normal to, uh, 
not have a full erection without some sort of stimulation. So don't worry about it too much. Okay, when using reverse Kegels during sex, do you push as hard as you can or steadily while deep breathing? I don't recommend doing reverse Kegels as hard as you can. Some, you know, I mean, you experiment with it, see what it does for you. But for me personally, when I push reverse Kegels at like maximum, it kind of creates a counter tension response. Meaning as soon as I let go, it like tenses up. It's too much, too much force. For me, I do reverse Kegels pretty gently, just like a slight push just to feel an expansion and a stretch. And that's how I do it. And you have, you, you have to kind of experiment with this to see how it affects you, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at with it. <clears throat> how big of a factor is clearing trauma or blockages in the bottom chakras first in order to be able to have a super O, an orgasm? I'm not sure if you're referring to a prostate orgasm or just a full body orgasm in general, but, um, in general, yes, if you have some serious, you know, blockages, traumas around sexuality, around your sexual experiences, then it's going to be difficult. It can be difficult for you to sur surrender to uh, orgasmic experiences. At the same time, if you have too much, you know, control, too much expectation, too much, I need to have this orgasm now or whatever, then that can block as well. There's a lot of factors to it, right? But in general, that's why I recommend doing clearing work. And I have a whole week of clearing work in my six week course. I recommend doing that before doing you know, the sexual practices because you need tools to clear out before you build something new. <clears throat> How to stop the unnecessary tensing of the pelvic floor. Uh, yeah, reverse Kegels can help. Also just relaxation exercises, breathing practices, breathing into your pelvic floor, you know, practicing stimulating while remaining completely relaxed. Um, making sound, making moaning sounds, making mmm sounds, vibrating your belly, vibrating the pelvic floor, that can help that as well. But And it can also be just a matter of, ten, of practice and releasing these tension patterns from your pelvic floor. Is the power lock technique damaging when you start the ejaculation process and then block it right before it comes out? What's your view on that? That is not the proper way to use the power lock. Uh, what you're, what's likely going to experience is you'll have a retrograde ejaculation. Um, you're having a peak orgasm, you're having a genital orgasm, and that's not the full body orgasm. The power lock is meant to be done before you hit the point of no return, because once you hit that point, it's too late. The, the, you're spasming, the fluid's moving. Um, you know, you may be able to hold it in, have like a weak, dry genital orgasm, the technique most people are teaching, or you may have a retrograde ejaculation. So I don't recommend doing that. It's not necessarily going to damage you, but you're having a, a peak orgasm, possibly ejaculatory orgasm. So the power lock you do before you hit the point of no return. So you're a point of high arousal. You use the power lock to draw that energy uh, out of the genitals and just kind of sit in that feeling like, whoa, what does it feel like to transfer all that sexual energy out of there and sit in that? It is a subtle orgasm just being in that space and start to identify that as an orgasm. Then you can start to expand on that sensation. Of course, it gets much more intense. There's other types of orgasms, but uh, that's kind of my recommendation with that. Is it possible to retain for years or even decades without ejaculating and have no negative side effects if you're practicing sexual Kung Fu? You know, I, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, one of my teachers, Michael Wynn, claims to have gone a decade without ejaculating and says he hadn't had any issues, but I don't know many other people who've gone that long. Um, I don't know. And for me, I, again, as I, as I say, a lot of experiments with everything from like super long-term retention to you know, ejaculating more frequently. And I found that four to six weeks of retention periods to be what makes me feel the best overall, the most balanced, the most, you know, uh, vital. So that's what it is for me, but you know, you can try it. <laughs> it's like, as long as you feel good and you feel balanced, yeah, keep going.
<clears throat> okay, if around six after taking uh, Viagra, am I, I am able to get an erection? Is that a sign that vascular aspects are fine or that's just the effect of Viagra? So around six, I'm not sure what you mean if around six, do you mean around 60, like you're age 60? I'm not exactly sure what the question is, but I think you're asking that because you're able to get a, an erection from Viagra, does that mean you don't have any vascular issues? It, I, it's difficult to say, you know, because that's the whole thing with Viagra is men who do have physical impairments are still able to get an erection by using Viagra, right? I'm not saying that taking Viagra is good. You know, it, it has a lot of side effects, things like that. I don't recommend pharmaceuticals in general, but you know, there's, there's, it, it, it's, it's vague for me to say anything, given what you've said, you know, it's kind of a vague description. What's that tingly feeling after Wim Hof breathing? Is it your Kundalini, just your cells hyperoxygenated? Uh, it's not necessarily Kundalini. You'd be blasting off to another planet if it was Kundalini. Um, it's just your, you know, your, your hyperoxygenate your body. Uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, your blood's becoming alkaline. You know, if you go, if you do that to an extreme level, you get uh, what's it called? Tetany, where your your joints and hands lock up. So it's just the kind of the physiological effects of breathing intensely like that. Okay, your view on the the V word. You know, the things people are shooting in their arms. Yeah, I have to be careful what I say on the internet right now, but. What's my view on the, the V word passport where you have to get the shot in the arm to travel anywhere, right? Again, this is just another part of this totalitarian medical fascism agenda where they're trying to put these things in people's bodies. Why, why are they so desperate you know, to where they require you to have this? You know, They're talking about uh, requiring you to have this before you go into stores, before you travel, things like that. You know, This is a very, you know, you have to really look at what's going on here, right? This is like, again, any, any, you know, you read 1984, you, all these dystopian future scenarios, this is like it, we're in it, right? So yeah, it's, it's, it's sketchy for sure, but I am optimistic that it's not going to roll out here and that people are going to, you know, not stand for this BS that's been trying to forced on, trying to be forced onto them. Six week course will be opening up again in April. How do I release tension in my downstairs area without ejaculating? I always release three weeks in because I can't handle the tension there. Hey, I mean, three weeks is a solid amount of time for a man to go. If that's like how long you can go without ejaculating, that's not a big deal. Like you're not losing much at, you're not losing at three weeks, you know? So don't worry, don't obsess over it too much. But uh, if you want to go further, yeah, testicle breathing is going to be number one, working with the microcosmic orbit every day grounding practices, you know, follow my Zhan Zhuan, standing meditation practice to ground that energy, uh, tennis ball massage, the perineum area, like I mentioned earlier in this video, you know, basically keep it flowing. Can I still build a strong sexual charge within my body without stimulation for weeks? Potentially, um, you know, if you're working with that energy, working with uh, the testicle breathing, breathing into the genitals, uh, kind of activating that energy in a non-aroused way and moving it through your body, you certainly can, but uh, there's also a lot of benefits to allowing yourself to experience arousal. That's what really activates, activates your hormones, activates the sexual energy. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, experiment with it, see what works for you. Okay, so six hours after taking the Viagra, you're able to get an erection. Does that mean that you're healthy? I honestly don't know. Um, I haven't, I don't, I haven't really studied Viagra because it's not something I'm interested in. I don't know how long the effects last, so you know, it's it's difficult for me to really answer your question. I'm 17. My plan is to retain and cultivate until my 30s when I start a family. All the while, building on a magnetic aura with non-ejaculatory sex and consistent internal energy work. I'm taking care of my prostate with massages. I will channel this energy into a career of competitive sport. What's your view on my situation? That sounds great. That's, it sounds like you've got your plan together and you're doing it. 
How can I have fast sex without getting overstimulated right away? Definitely take my free ejaculation control course uh, to learn the techniques of controlling your ejaculation, but you may want to start off a bit slow. Uh, for most men, the most difficult part of sex is the first few minutes, which is where you know, most men ejaculate is at the first few minutes. So slow down a bit, calm down, breathe deeply and kind of take it, you know, gentle for the first little bit there. And then once you kind of get it under control, then you can speed it up, get a little more, uh, a little more intense, a little more aggressive with it. The more you focus on your penis, the more you send energy into there. So one of the keys to ejaculation control is to not focus on your penis. Think about feel other areas of your body, concentrate your awareness in uh, your belly, your, your chest, your heart area, your brain. You know, if you focus on these areas, then you're not so hypersensitive in your penis. Focus on your partner's body. See if you can feel into their body and that will draw some of your own sexual energy into their body and exchange it. So, you know, these are kind of some tips, uh, deep belly breathing, maintaining that is very important as well as, you know, when you're, when you're in the more advanced work, s consistently moving that energy, the sexual energy through your microcosmic orbit as it's building up. <clears throat> When I block the ejaculation right before it comes out, this triggers a whole orgasmic energy moving through my brains and higher chakras. Only through this ejaculation process can I access this energy. What should I change? Well, it just means you're still limited to that peak ejaculatory orgasm. You're just having an ejaculatory orgasm and with a bit more heightened experience of it, you know, feeling it in the rest of your body as well. That's great, but it's still shooting your sexual energy out of you. Uh, the key is training in sexual kung fu practices. Learn to release your addiction and need for peak orgasms. Check out my video on the Valley Orgasm on YouTube. Um, because uh, full body orgasm is different than that short lived, intense, you know, peaking experience that leaves you drained afterwards. Okay, after a long time without ejaculation, I don't experience blue balls anymore. Is that a sign of erectile dysfunction due to softer erections? Uh, well, blue balls and erectile dysfunction may or may not have, are not necessarily related at all. So not experiencing blue balls doesn't sound like a problem. Uh, you'll know if you have erectile dysfunction because you're unable to get erections. So it's, it's kind of two different things here. Tips on sustaining erection without porn or fantasy during penis enhancement exercises that require a constant erection, but in the past I've relied on porn or fantasy, don't want to sacrifice potential gains or risk relapse. Um, <clears throat> you have to be careful with some of those PE exercises, especially like the jelking type practice. If you're doing too much of it, jelking, I'm no longer doing jelking because uh, you're forcing blood in a direction it's not meant to go and in your blood vessels in your penis. Uh, the penis, the way blood flows, so, okay, here's a penis. This is the spongiosum, right? It, blood flows into the penis this direction at the bottom, the spongiosum, and then it flows out of the penis this way, the dorsal veins at the top, those big veins. And if you're shoving everything that way, the jelking, it's actually forcing blood to go the wrong way in your penis. This can cause damage. That's why I'm not doing jelking practice anymore. I'm using a different practice. If you're doing jelking, don't press on this upper side of the penis. Only, you know, kind of leverage your, 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 fingers so that it only pushes the blood through the spongy osum because that's the direction blood's meant to flow in. Again, doing this, it forces blood in the wrong way. It can damage your penis. And that can be part of the issue if you're doing too much of these PE exercises and not able to hold erections, right? So maybe something to look into that. I recommend the Angion method, A-N-G-I-O-N. Check that out. The guy has lots of videos of it on YouTube. Um, and, but as far as sustaining your erection, um, there's a lot of factors to it, right? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating healthy? You know, getting your minerals, as I mentioned before, you know, there's a lot to it. How long before I had my, my full, full body orgasm? Uh, it was, how long was it? It was, it didn't, it, well, 
okay, after I was with a partner, that's when I really started experiencing was like doing, having sexual cultivation with a partner. And it was pretty quickly, you know, it was one of the, in the first few times that that happened. Um, and I was several months into my training at that point, probably six, seven, eight months in. But don't worry about timelines. Again, if you're obsessing about this should be happening at this timeline, if you're trying to make the orgasm happen with these valley full body orgasms, it's not, you know, you can't force it. It's just something you just observe. Just observe what's happening, what you're feeling instead of like, oh, I need to be at this place at a certain time. Okay, what do I suggest for female sexual energy work? Uh, so for women, it's about... Uh, women, you know, of course, women can still work the microcosmic orbit. I have a video on testicle breathing, right? For women, the practice is ovarian breathing, breathing into the ovary. So you could follow that practice video or find, you know, someone who's teaching ovarian breathing, or instead of breathing into the testicles, as I instruct in the video, you breathe into the ovaries and the, the, the yoni, and then circulate the energy through the body from there. So that's the female version of the practice. Breast massage is also very, very important for women. Uh, helps to really enhance your hormone levels and things like that. Uh, jade egg practice, which are these, you know, egg shaped pieces of precious of, of stones, you know, crystals, whatever that women insert into their yonis and use that to kind of activate the yoni space, clear out, you know, for women, it's really about clearing out the womb space because women tend to absorb their negative emotions, the traumas in the space of the womb is this empty space, right? And so it becomes difficult to connect with your sexuality when you have all this kind of uh, past issues stored there, right? So for the women, it's all about clearing out that space um, and then some other things as, as well. Uh, making the menstrual cycle less intense, less you know depleting because for women, they lose their energy through menstruation as men lose it through ejaculation. So uh, when you have a practice to release negative emotions, stress, traumas, which the body uses its own you know blood, its own gene to release, when you have a practice to release those things, then your, uh, your cycles will become much more enjoyable. <clears throat> okay, what's the difference? Okay, I, I'm just wrapping up here, guys. I'm just going to take a couple more questions. Okay, what's the difference between, what's the difference from dry orgasm others are teaching <clears throat> and my practice? What most people are teaching, and I talk about this all the time, is that this is what 90% or more of male multiple orgasm techniques involve is basically getting, you know, strengthening your, your pelvic floor muscles, doing lots of Kegels. And then basically you, during sexual stimulation, masturbation, sex, you hit the point of no return. You hit the point at which ejaculation starts, and then you squeeze your pelvic floor muscles and stop stimulation. And if you do it right, then you have this short, you know, spasms in the prostate, a little bit of an orgasm there, but you don't ejaculate. And these can become a bit more intense. You know, again, I've, I've done this technique uh, and it's just not that impressive. Yeah. You can have them over and over again, but they're just, they're just not that great. It's like a 10, you know, it's like half or a quarter of an ejaculatory orgasm, sometimes as intense as an ejaculatory orgasm, but that's it. You know, it's again, it's just this five to 10 second short lived peak orgasm. And that's what most men are talking, most people are talking about when they say male multiple orgasms. And that's fine. You know, it's, it's still in enjoyable. It's, it's better than just having one ejaculatory orgasm. You can have like 10 or more over and over that are a bit less intense. That's fine. But the full, you know, the orgasm experiences that I'm talking about, the practice I'm teaching you, it's miles. It's, it's a thousand times more intense and powerful than that. Uh, it's it's not as easy, I will say, to accomplish because, again, as I say a lot, it's more of a letting go into a state of orgasm versus, you know, this technique uh, to accomplish something, the peak orgasm, right? There's techniques that help you achieve the full body orgasm, but what these feel like is because these multiple male orgasms most people are teaching, people are teaching, they're completely limited to the genital space. It's just that spasm in the prostate, that orgasm down there, which, you know, it's pleasurable, but it's it's the tip of the iceberg. The full body orgasm is, it can be life changing. Um, for me, it's like when it's like that, that sensation when you're about to ejaculate, you know, that like, Oh, like, all right. You know, it's kind of like that, but it's, it's not so urgent. It's not so like, Oh God, you know, this is going to happen. It's more of like, Oh, okay. And it builds. And for me, it moves into my belly and I start to feel that in my belly. And it's this deep, like opening sensation, like really this vulnerability, like uh, it's hard to explain. And 
the first time I experienced it, it kind of scared me and I like shut it off. I was like, whoa, that's too much, you know? Um, but if you can let it go, it builds and it builds. And it it's sometimes it moves up to my heart space. And I feel like my heart opening, especially, you know, with my partner. Um, I've had one where it was like my brain felt like a penis and it was like ejaculating out my crown and my you know, time is altered, space is altered. It's very psychedelic. If you've ever had psychedelics, it feels like that space of just the infinite moment, deep emotional connection with my partner. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm just like shooting away from my body and expanding out of the cosmos. And it sounds like stereotypical <laughs> hippie stuff, but like, it's what it feels like. So that's the difference between this full body orgasm that sexual Kung Fu provides versus the five to 10 second little, you know, spasm that is the genital orgasm. And again, that's what 95% of men are teaching when they talk about male multiple orgasms. So yeah, that's the difference. There are some devices which can, which tracked, I'm not, they stretch the penis that in order for hours in order to enlarge the penis. Can these devices cause permanent damages? Um, they can definitely cause some damages too much stretching of your penis tissue. You know, yes, it can damage it. So be careful with that. You know, yeah, <laughs> don't overdo it with those. Okay. I'm getting, f uh, okay. So yeah, Nas, sorry, I'm saying your name, right? Nas Rockin. Uh, the live streams are all saved on my YouTube channel. You can watch all of them and they're saved there. Uh, okay. So I'm getting frustrated with testicle breathing as I struggle to feel the energy flow up my spine to the top of my skull. Also, how do you know if you are contracting the pelvic floor correctly? Uh, so first of all, don't worry about not feeling it. It takes time to really build the chi. It takes time to develop your sensitivity. Just because you're not feeling it doesn't mean nothing's happening. Uh, but I will say, if you want to increase your ability to feel chi and really build the chi you have so that it becomes more tangible, work with the Dantian practice. Dantian breathing, practice that every day. It will build your battery so you actually have a supply of chi, which you can start to move through your body. And then it becomes very, very tangible. So that's important. And then, okay, the second part, how do you know if you're contracting the pelvic floor correctly? Don't, it's the pelvic floor part. That's, it's just physical kind of uh, augmentation of the practice. It's really not important. You don't even need to contract your pelvic floor. Don't, don't worry about it. There's really, you know, it's an energetic practice. And so your physical engagements don't necessarily matter. I will say, don't squeeze it too hard. If you're going to squeeze it, I don't usually squeeze my pelvic floor during testicle breathing, at least not very hard. Let's do a very, very light kind of engagement there. So yeah, I hope that, hope that's helpful. Okay, last question. I'm going to answer them. I'm going to jump off, guys. But we're almost an hour and a half in. <laughs> what is your thought on the $1 million spot? Uh, it's a very, very crude entry level technique. I teach it in my courses because it's something, you know, can help when you're learning, you know, training this stuff uh, to grow, avoid going over the edge. Um, but it's not something that should be your main method. You still have a peak orgasm, you still lose energy, even if you do it properly. Uh, most men, when they do this, they'll have a retrograde ejaculation where they ejaculate into the bladder and then you, you urinate out the semen and you might as well have ejaculated out. Um, don't use this like every day. Don't do it every day. It can cause stagnance because you're holding in, you're physically blocking the ejaculation mechanism. So don't do it every day. Um, you know, again, for me, it's just kind of like a training tool until you can actually, you know, use the more internal methods to have ejaculatory control and full body orgasms. Have you heard of Savage Grow Plus supplements? Uh, you have to be careful with these, these supplements people sell and like, oh, you take this, your penis is gonna grow two inches. Most of these, it, it's not true. Um, they usually have most of the same ingredients which are just like sexual enhancer ingredients, which is great, but like, you know, taking a pill is not gonna grow your penis. Okay, guys, uh, I'm going to jump off. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a good weekend. Uh, I might not be going, I might be not be on here next week. I'm doing another vision quest, uh, four days in the mountains, no technology. So uh, I may or may not make it on here next week. We'll see. But uh, take it easy, guys. Hope you're doing well. And uh, I'll see you next time.